Hi everyone, we're talking about urinary incontinence in this lesson. So we're going to talk about the different types of urinary incontinence, the symptoms of each type. We're also going to talk about how they're diagnosed and how they're treated. So urinary incontinence is a loss of bladder control with involuntary urination or loss of urine. Now, I mentioned that there are different types of urinary incontinence. One type is known as stress incontinence. Another type is known as urge incontinence. Another type is mixed incontinence, which is a mixture of both stress and urge incontinence. The fourth type is overflow incontinence, and a fifth type is known as functional incontinence. So we're going to talk about each of these in more detail in the next upcoming slides, including some of the risk factors for each of them and what actually happens with each type. So what is the epidemiology of urinary incontinence? In general, more women are affected by urinary incontinence than men. But as we will see, certain types of urinary incontinence are more common in women and some types are more common in men. But overall, urinary incontinence in general, more common in women. And urinary incontinence in general is more prevalent in older people than in younger people. And this will all tie in with the risk factors as to why these types of urinary incontinence occur. Now let's talk about the types of urinary incontinence in more detail, along with the causes of each. So again, we look at stress incontinence first. The causes of stress incontinence are as follows. So stress incontinence is due to a weakening of muscles that support the pelvis and pelvic structures. So these muscles can weaken over time. So increasing age as a patient gets older, this is a cause or risk factor for having stress incontinence. Another cause or risk factor for getting stress incontinence is vaginal delivery. So vaginal delivery of a baby causes weakness and stretching of some of those supportive pelvic muscles, which can lead to a decreased ability to actually control bladder emptying or voiding. Pelvic surgery is another risk factor, another cause. So we can imagine that if there is any surgery in the pelvic area, some of the muscles could be damaged or weakened. This will increase the likelihood of stress incontinence. Menopause is also another risk factor and smoking is a risk factor. Now let's talk about urge incontinence. So urge incontinence is also known as an overactive bladder, and ultimately it's due to detrusor overactivity. So the detrusor muscles are responsible for allowing contraction of the bladder, allowing proper urination and proper urinary control. But with urge incontinence, there is detrusor overactivity. The muscle, the detrusor muscle is overactive. So some of the causes for urge incontinence are as follows. One and the main one here is idiopathic causes, which means we don't know what the cause might be. This occurs in roughly 90% of patients with urge incontinence. A second cause of urge incontinence is detrusor muscle instability. A third cause is central nervous system lesions. So CNS lesions, you can think of spinal cord injuries. So if there is a spinal cord injury, there can be problems in neural control over the detrusor muscle. So this can lead to detrusor overactivity. Another common or more common cause of urge incontinence is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which occurs in men. So BPH can be a risk factor for urge incontinence. Other types of obstruction like bladder neck obstruction can also lead to urge incontinence. Cystitis, so especially chronic cystitis, chronic inflammation of the bladder can lead to an overactive bladder. Increasing age is also another risk factor and obesity is another risk factor for urge incontinence. Now let's talk about overflow incontinence. So overflow urinary incontinence is caused by urinary retention. And it is essentially the opposite of urge incontinence where there is impaired detrusor contractility. So the causes of overflow incontinence are as follows. Benign prostatic hyperplasia is a very significant cause of overflow urinary incontinence. So BPH again occurring in men, an enlarged prostate that essentially obstructs the outflow of urine and then the bladder can become stretched and stretched and this can lead to issues with the detrusor muscle, impaired detrusor contractility. We can also see it with diabetes, other types of central nervous system lesions and multiple sclerosis. So if there are certain pathologies that are affecting the ability to actually contract the detrusor muscle, these can lead to overflow urinary incontinence. And then there is functional urinary incontinence. 
And essentially functional urinary incontinence is where a patient is not able to get to the bathroom in time. Perhaps they really need to use a washroom. And we see this in older patients. So some of the causes include environmental barriers to toileting and then other physical impairments. If they're not able to walk or be mobile, this can also be another cause of functional urinary incontinence. Essentially, functional urinary incontinence is where a patient really has to use the washroom, but they can't. They're not able to make it to the toilet, and then they have a issue of voiding when they shouldn't. But that's mostly because they can't get to the toilet. Now that we know the types of urinary incontinence and the risk factors and causes of urinary incontinence, let's talk about the clinical features of each type. So the first type we're gonna talk about is stress incontinence. Now this is a very common type of urinary incontinence. Again, it is involuntary urination or loss of urine. But with regards to stress incontinence, this involuntary loss of urine occurs in particular situations. And those situations are when there is increased intra-abdominal pressure. So what does that mean? When there's increased pressure in your abdomen, there can be some loss of urine. Again, this is due to weakness of those pelvic muscles we talked about before. There is decreased ability to control when the bladder releases urine, especially when there's increased intra-abdominal pressures. So some of these situations include coughing. So coughing increases intra-abdominal pressure, causing some loss of urine. Sneezing. Sneezing is another situation where we see some loss of urine. Lifting. So any lifting or heavy lifting will increase the intra-abdominal pressures leading to some loss of urine. Laughing is another situation where there can be some loss of urine as well. And exercising. So these are all situations that can lead to loss of urine in stress incontinence. This is what stress urinary incontinence is, when there is some loss of urine during these types of situations. Now let's talk about urge incontinence. So this is a different type of urinary incontinence as we will see in a moment. So urge incontinence is when there's a loss of urine that occurs when there's a sudden urge to urinate. So the patient goes throughout their day and all of a sudden they have a very strong urge to urinate and then there can be some loss of urine. So it's a very different clinical presentation than stress incontinence. So with urge incontinence, there is urinary urgency and urge to urinate. And then with urge incontinence, there's also an increased urinary frequency. So patients will feel that they have to go to the washroom very quickly and very frequently. And then with urge incontinence, there's also nocturia, which means urinating at night. So they will be awakened at night with a sudden urge to urinate as well. And there can be some loss of urine in those situations. So you can see that there's a very big difference between stress incontinence and urge incontinence. Now let's talk about overflow incontinence. So overflow incontinence is when there's an involuntary urination, loss of urine with a full bladder. So this differs from the previous types of urinary incontinence we just talked about. I didn't mention before, but urge incontinence, a patient may have an urge to urinate even when they don't have much fluid in their bladder. So a very big difference here. So overflow incontinence is when there's a loss of urine with a full bladder. So with overflow incontinence, there is a full bladder and patient feels they need to urinate, but they can't. There's difficulty urinating. And then there's some urinary straining as well. So there's difficulty starting urination, and then there's difficulty continuing urination. So this is where there is detrusor inactivity or a low activity of the detrusor muscle. And then also with overflow incontinence, there is a poor emptying of the bladder. So this is considered a lazy bladder. The bladder is not able to contract and release urine as well as it should. And then there's mixed incontinence. We mentioned this before. It's a mixture of stress and urge incontinence features. And then I won't mention the functional incontinence as this is something that occurs when a patient has a full bladder, they feel like they need to use a washroom, they try, but there's some barrier. They either have some physical immobility or there's some barrier in the environment and they're not able to make it on time. And they have a loss of urine, and that is what we would call functional urinary incontinence. So now that we know the types of urinary incontinence and what happens with each of them, how are each of these diagnosed and treated? Clinicians diagnose urinary incontinence often by clinical diagnosis. So they get a detailed history from the patient. They see the types of symptoms that the patient is describing, and the patient has some of those risk factors we talked about. That is enough to make the diagnosis.
But it's also important to check medications that could be causing some issues with urinary incontinence. And it's also important to check a urinalysis for any signs of a UTI or urinary tract infection. And then blood urea nitrogen can also be measured as well. Now, the treatment of urinary incontinence depends on the type of urinary incontinence. With stress incontinence, it's important to have lifestyle modification, so fluid intake scheduling, so drinking fluids at particular times and avoiding other times, timed voids, so ensuring that the bladder is empty. So if there is a situation where there is laughter or sneezing or coughing, there won't be as much loss of urine or no loss at all. And then weight loss can also help. Weight loss can reduce intra-abdominal pressures. So you can imagine that if you have a larger abdomen, you're going to have more pressure within the abdomen. You're going to have increased intra-abdominal pressure, which is going to make it easier to have stress incontinence. Now, some other methods to treat stress incontinence are Kegel exercises. These are pelvic floor exercises. If you want more information on Kegel exercises, please look this up online. And pharmacological treatments are also available to treat stress incontinence in some situations. And one example for stress incontinence is phenylpropylamine. For the treatment of urge incontinence, similar to lifestyle treatments for stress incontinence, but the pharmacological treatments are different. So some of the pharmacological treatments for an urge incontinence or an overactive bladder include darifenacin, solifenacin, oxybutynin, and mirabegron. So these are some of the pharmacological treatments that can be used to help with an overactive bladder. With overflow incontinence, because there's issues with voiding, with either initiating or maintaining urinary output, intermittent catheterization or indwelling catheter is one possible method to treat overflow incontinence. If there is a obstruction that is identified, obstruction relief is important. And then some of the pharmacological treatments that are available for overflow incontinence include terazosin and tamsulosin. These help with reducing urinary retention. And then with functional incontinence, it's important to identify and alleviate the barriers to that patient getting to the toilet. So as you can see, each type of incontinence is different, has a different, different clinical presentation, has a different set of risk factors, and it has a different set of treatments. Stress incontinence, again, important for lifestyle, Kegel exercises, and possibly some pharmacological treatment. Urge incontinence, you're going to see more pharmacological treatments being used for this overactive bladder type of urinary incontinence. Overflow incontinence, because there's some issues with urinary retention or actual issues with voiding itself, sometimes catheters may be used and some other pharmacological treatments may be used. So the alpha antagonists like terazosin and tamsulosin, and then functional incontinence, important to identify and alleviate the barriers for an individual to actually get to the toilet. So if you want to learn more about other types of urological and nephrological conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.